welcome to those uh, in the, uh, experiencing uh, their rainbow bodies, or at least I'm experiencing your rainbow bodies through video. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I look at the laptop here sometimes because I can't see the screen set. You guys see, so let me, let's see, which camera? Um, this camera. Hi. Okay. That's good. Yeah. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about um, the practice of Vajragini, a tantric practice. And um, the reason I'm talking about this um, right now is um, we've asked um, uh, one of our teachers to come in January and give a Vajrayogini uh, initiation impairment. <clears throat> so uh, it's really a good idea to have some idea of what you're doing before you do it. <laughs> um, so uh, that's, I might give another talk about Vajrayogini be before that time. I think if all goes well, we'll see uh, Ken Surimshe Losong Dalek um, maybe the middle of January, maybe second weekend in January, something like that. So uh, I pray that will come available and um, you will be available if that's what you're interested in. Um, Ken Surimshe means former emer emeritus abbot, precious one, his. Uh, one of his names, that's kind of title, one of his names, Losang means like fine mind, find awareness, fine awareness, Delek means like well-being. It's nice names, huh? <laughs> Some of you already have like nice Dharma names that start with Yeshe, uh, primordial awareness, stuff like that. <clears throat> and it's possible we'll be doing um, a uh, ceremony where people will be formally taking refuge as um in dharma maybe maybe in december we'll see we'll see if um gishu damchala is available he's um i think he's feeling a little lighthearted now light, lighter because he um recently passed his citizenship exam um I don't think I could pass the test. I haven't seen the test, but <laughs> he, um, so he, he gets an American passport. It um, uh, will help particularly with, with travel um, because uh, uh, it's difficult if you just ha even just have a green card to travel these days, particularly. It also means that he would be able to spend significant time at one of the tantric monasteries uh, um, and complete that tantric training, which um, it might last a year. So um, we might not see him for a year, a little less than a year, something like that. That's difficult practice. He has to um, memorize some more texts and participate in, in um, long, some long rituals, maybe four hours long at a time, something like that, or more. <clears throat> so uh, I wish him well with that. So I like to do the refuge along with Geshe Damshla, and hopefully, maybe we can do it next month coming up. So, hmm. um, we don't have a, a, a Jagini Tanka in the Gompa, the shrine room now. I should have thought ahead and maybe. Uh, Eli could have projected it on the board for you or something. I, I don't know. Maybe it's too late to do that. It's Vajogini. Yeah, maybe we'll see what happens. This Vajogini, Vajogini um, has uh, traditionally different, uh, some different iconography. The one um, that's most popular in our tradition, she's uh, depicted in, in a warrior pose. Some people know what that is in yoga, the warrior pose. Um, um, <clears throat> very um, triumphant. Um, so uh, we'll see if they find the right one. They're various, various. Oh, Patty knows which one. Yeah, thank you. So maybe we can project that. <clears throat> um, 
Vajrayana practice uh, is a uh, uh, difficult practice and easy practice depending upon one's predispositions and one's attitude, one's fortitude. <clears throat> uh, in uh, beginning practice for ourselves, beginning Buddhism, beginning uh, training, we primarily have to be aware that um, we're doing activities that are probably harming ourselves, right? So very much the first vehicle is concentrating on just do no harm to ourselves and others. So it has to do with uh, kind of cleaning up our act, right? Um, just not harming, following uh, precepts that are based on non-harming, non-clinging, following uh, lifestyles that are helpful. Oh yeah, that's that's uh, that's very good. So, um, and uh, that method of practice doesn't stop. We we keep doing that practice, by the way. So the different practices in our tradition don't don't drop off like some rocket thing. We keep doing them. But uh, when we develop more, then uh, we enter what's called a Mahayana phase where um, we're connecting also with our uh, basic goodness, also with our warmth and compassion and our deep desire to uh, relieve suffering, not only for ourselves, which is how we start, but also uh, for others. So this is called the uh, development of bodhicitta, uh, uh, inability to bear others' suffering in our own. So we create a, a vow, an aspiration, a spirit of, uh, I must awaken, I must uh, develop myself to the highest capacity, and the best capacity is to be awake, to be a Buddha, and that way I can help the most people. <clears throat> The Buddha also taught what's called Tantra or Vajrayana, which is um, sometimes described as a turbocharged um, Mahayana practice. So um, I call it for a desperate people. <laughs> so, um, or a kind of, um, you know, uh, emergency room training, right? So, um, when, when people are working as a therapist in private practice or um, medical doctor or nurse in um, you know, outpatient clinic, um, you generally see you know, kind of the walking wounded, right? Um, people that can enough, they're in crisis, but they can get themselves to the office or something, get themselves to the clinic, but um, uh, when we're working in the actual hospital or emergency room, then people need something really fast, really a lot of expertise, um, really a lot of coordination and skill from the staff. Um, still helping, but, and there's still social workers and therapists at the hospital, but um, primarily we're helping people get out of uh, extreme crisis, whether it's emotional or mental or physical, okay? So Vajrayana, or the Diamond Way, or the Indestructible Way sometimes, or Tantra, the Way of Continuity, is um, the um, emergency room uh, hospital of Buddhism. <clears throat> but uh, a good healthcare system, uh, like our wonderful healthcare systems here in Sacramento, I'm gonna say nice things today for some reason, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, of course, have like hospitals, you know, medical hospitals, maybe uh, emotional mental health, behavioral health hospitals, and uh, outpatient clinics, and um, outpatient therapists they refer to, and urgent care. They have a whole range, right? A whole range of help. So that's um, actually the primary model with Vajrayana. Is it's emergency care. Um, but with ongoing uh, care too. So it, it covers the whole range. So in our tradition, we practice what's called the three vehicles of individual liberation, um, uh, uh, the Mahayana of uh, 
uh, complete liberation in the Vajrayana of indestructible goodness, liberation. So we practice all of them, that. Vajrayogini particularly um, is uh, a practice that's uh, very much a tantric practice. <clears throat> Why is it tantra? Because um, <clears throat> tantra practice is founded on the um, indestructible goodness of Buddha nature. When we're um, working on ourselves from uh, just reducing harm or being friendly or even helping others, we we still might be more concerned with um, the a little slower path and gradually gradually improving ourselves. Right? We all are here, probably. Right? But let's say um, you only had. Um, or you were in an emergency, or you only had a few hours to live, and you said, I, I just want the complete, absolute, the whole thing, like right now, just just give it to me. So that's the real Vajrayana practice. I'm desperate, just, just tell me the whole truth right now. You know, I, I can handle it. Um, <clears throat> so then uh, just the Vajrayana practice is, um, we're, we're not even going to talk about um, your faults very much. We're just going to completely turn turn the light on, completely identify with all your positive and enlightened qualities right away. We're not going to do the gradual improvement. We just need, we need to either get you out of the burning house right away, or we need to tell you um, you're, you're completely loved right away. This sometimes happens, of course, we have to have like a Vajrayana approach when um, in, mental and behavioral health, working with people that are suicidal or very desperate. Sometimes we have to tell people right away, you're loved, you're meant to be here, don't kill yourself, stay here, stay here, stay here, right? Very direct, very, you know, you know really give, uh, you know, really give a blast of goodness quickly, right? <clears throat> Most of us though, are kind of like um, walking neurotics. So that that is more like, you know, work on yourself and gradually develop self-compassion, right? But Vajrayana is quickly, quickly, I want you to identify with your goodness. I want you to identify with your sanity right away, right away. Don't have time. Or it's so desperate, you, you have to really, um, I want you to get that you're loved and cared for right away, right now, nowhere else, right? So um, in, in India, and then later in the countries that embrace Vajrayana, um, they decided that uh, to directly connect with our Buddha nature, our goodness, our indestructible sanity and love, uh, it's useful to identify with um, uh, a form. Many people, of course, identify historically with the Buddha Shakyamuni form. So uh, uh, we do that when we're sitting quietly but also some people realized, you know, that's maybe not always necessary. So don't Buddhas also manifest in female form? Yes. And don't um, Buddhas also manifest in whatever form is necessary um, to help liberate and, and to help know uh, who we are, right? So the, um, the Buddha nature um, manifests sometimes and for those who are connected with very often as Vajogini. So uh, here you saw on the screen, I don't, it's gone now, right? I don't know. Uh, so I can't tell. You're putting it back up again or? Okay, so, okay, this is another one. <laughs> That's good, let's see, I'm looking. So here Vajogini, so, um, this is warrior pose. She has in her right hand um, a chopping knife. Um, you don't have to point it out, but you know, then it's, been, <laughs> it's like a PowerPoint. <clears throat> and in her left hand, she has a skull and she's drinking blood. This is a pretty powerful image, don't you think? And on top of that, of course, uh, she's completely naked except for bone ornaments, um, particularly um, her necklace, which is made of uh, small human skulls. 
well, regular human skulls, because Vajrakini is actually pretty big. And then she's crushing um, some uh, misperceived uh, ideas and cells under her feet, right? It's pretty powerful. So there's a victory thing, and she's just looking up. And then uh, on her um, left shoulder, then she has the Katvanga, the staff, with um, a recently severed head and a um, decaying head, and then finally a skull. Uh, so she has a weapon too, right? She has two weapons, really, staff and the chopping knife. And um, you can't see it so well on this one, but uh, her mouth is open and she has vampire fangs. <laughs> like that. <clears throat> So sometime, and then of course, wisdom fire behind her, and she's standing on a sun disc, a sun platform cushion. There's a lotus, and underneath that would be a moon, but um, fierce manifestations of our Buddha nature are shown on, um, usually um, on the sun, sun aspect. So the golden, golden sun. <clears throat> So uh, it sounds kind of like interesting if somebody says, I'm really disconnected from my basic goodness. I'm disconnected. I'm discouraged about my life. Uh, I don't think I'm any good. I, in fact, people are idiots too. <laughs> you know, that really nihilistic place is kind of interesting in our tradition. Um, we, we might say, follow your breath. We might say, you know, develop loving kindness. We might say, uh, please do acts of um, goodness, random acts of kindness in the neighborhood. Please just meditate. Um, you know, please go to the spa, something. <laughs> but in other cases, we might say, please, I, you know, completely identify with these qualities of uh, fierce, loving wisdom, right? Like that. Right now, please, just uh, be, be Vajragini, like that. From the inside, um, Vajragini is um, completely like peaceful, completely um, uh, liberated, uh, has absolutely no aggression. Um, but uh, for the sake of awakening uh, these qualities, um, she shows that she cuts through um, misperceived self, cuts through uh, delusions. You know, so when we say delusions, we have to be really clear, like delusions are like, I'm screwed, delusions forever, I'll never be any good, delusions are um, the, you know, the world's going down, it's going to all blow up, or it's useless, delusions are, um, you know, Trump won the election, you know, the crazy things, right? So we, we cut those off with, just like this, cutting off. Also, all kinds of um, thoughts that get in the way and emotions that um, are unsustainable when we compare them to our actual lived experience. So from the inside, you know, uh, Vajrakini feels completely um, open and available and warm uh, and uh, fiercely aware of not only her situation, but other situation too, because um, she has absolutely no fear. That's one of, and openness, that's quite uh, traditionally um, displayed as, as naked, just naked awareness. It's really scary to be just naked awareness sometimes. Like sometimes the scariest question is, just tell me what you're really thinking. <laughs> Okay, let's play truth or dare. Just tell me what you're really, really thinking. What are you really thinking of me actually right now? <laughs> uh, um, the essence of for me of Adragini is really connecting with um, what I call a wisdom love. Um, uh, of course, all the uh, Buddhas. Uh, you know, are epitomize the wisdom love, but with Vajragini, um, it's particularly emphasized uh, the passionate, blissful side of wisdom. 
So in our tradition, uh, Tantra tradition, uh, wisdom isn't cold and analytic, the wisdom that sees things as they are, the wisdom that knows how to help others and help ourselves uh, is radiant and uh, warm and um, liberated and blissful. So this is a defining characteristic of Tantra is that um, we use um, or we enhance um, our energy and our positive uh, uh, energies of uh, bliss to uh, connect with others and to help others. We're not um, coldly analytical. We can be coldly analytical as um, demonstrated by uh, the knife that cuts off conceptual thought. But um, the overall emphasis in Rajagini with the red color is the warmth, right? <clears throat> So um, sometimes, um, you know, Buddha Dharma is talked about as being, you know, you know just wisdom or peace. Um, but uh, in our tradition, we actually like to get to know people and uh, we like to extend our heart. So um, we call it um, blissful wisdom love like that. So the, when we say compassion, um, uh, we mean relieving others for, from suffering and ourselves from suffering. But when we say love in our tradition, we mean um, uh, really joyful delight in someone's presence, right? Love means you want to support and, and nurture what brings um, happiness to others, right? You wish fervently for their happiness if you love someone. So that's why a number of times in this <laughs> temple I've said, if you want to do Tantra, you at least have to love somebody or something, right? That's um, helpful. <laughs> so um, people say, well, can I, can, I love, can I love my pet, you know? So yes, <laughs> so there's a famous um, Mahasiddha or um, uh, perfected adept in Sanskrit um, that um, his companion was uh, his dog. So is known as Kukaripa dog lover. So um, actually, we happen to be more of a cat person right now, but um, so it could be a cat. Um, but um, also, if people come to Middleway Health, um, they'll notice um, I like fish too. Cat, <laughs> like my cat. <clears throat> uh, many years ago. Um, People have talked about um, creating some kind of catalog. So um, people that come into the uh, shrine room here, the Gompa wouldn't know like who the various archetypal figures are. So um, I want to like uh, jumpstart that a little bit by um, hopefully making it simpler for um, you know whoever um, decides to undertake that gargantuan task. Um, so uh, in our tradition, the, um, the main archetype is the archetype of the teacher, because we're not, um, we're not a revelation uh, lineage. Um, I like quoting the, the Buddha's um, poem saying, the Buddhas do not um, wash away sins with water. They do not uh, transfer uh, you know, realizations, uh, you know, to others. They can't, um, you know, heal just by laying out of hands. The Buddhas only teach. So some of the archetypal in images behind me, you know, are teachers like Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, Guru Rinpoche. Uh, we don't have uh, Tsongkhapa, Dalai Lama. Um, we don't have a Yeshe Sogyo Tonka. Maybe sometime we'll have that. <clears throat> so that's the you know people that are truly really teaching. It's difficult being a teacher, don't you think? From my side, I don't know. Are there any teachers here? Like yes, <laughs> right. So um, <clears throat> of course, I'm teaching in this capacity. Um, uh, also, you know, mental health practitioner. Um, also, I think. Uh, I really respect mental health practitioners and medical practitioners, but I think teaching is more difficult um, because you actually 
the students actually have to learn something and then the teacher's held accountable, right? Um, but I've joked about this with my mental health friends. If people in mental and behavioral health don't get better, we just blame the patient. It's really sad, isn't it? You know, it shouldn't be the case. We should go, wow, that, that didn't work out, you know? And so instead of saying, oh, that person's non-compliant or resistant, we just go, we need to do better. But uh, so the archetype of the teacher is the, the highest uh, in our tradition. Um, and somewhere we have uh, Tanka Manjushri, the gold, small uh, gold Tanka there. Um, that represents, you know, really and truly uh, being present and aware, uh, the wisdom aspect. So uh, that that's that's key. So just because the tanka small doesn't mean not important. Because <laughs> wisdom, you know, being present aware is just like you, you got to know what's going on, right? I mean, you don't want to be lied to. You need to know what's going on. You just need to see things the way they actually are, right? Because if the light's not in, you'll bump into stuff and trip over stuff. So let's turn the light on. Uh, this, there's another, um, the statue's not uh, in the Gompa here, but Achala uh, is a bodhisattva, which means um, immovable. In this case, not like a big rock, but truly an, an, um, truly steadfast bodhicitta. So that's the eighth the levels of bodhisattvahood. So if you reach eighth level, there's 10, then um, you're, you're there. We all have like bodhicitta dips, right? Bodhicitta is like our desire to be of service and to wake up and help people out of suffering. And there are all days where we're kind of like low bodhicitta. But uh, when, so achala doesn't mean we never get low bodhicitta, it just means we, we don't give up on others. Or ourselves. Tungpa Rinpoche was nice this way. He just said, "I don't give up on anyone." I really saw that as true. There was a few people there that were really annoying and difficult, and I wish he had given up on them. <laughs> uh, we actually have two Vajrasattvas here. So on either side, one with consort and one solo. So uh, Vajrasattva is really about like. Um, really truly having a fresh start. Like this moment's totally, each moment's totally open, pure, no problems. You can put problems in it, but it starts fresh. So Vajrasattva practice is a major practice and um, some people are lucky enough to have time and motivation to do Vajrasattva when, when Dirk is doing Vajrasattva and uh, phases the moon. So shout out to you, Dirk, thank you. So then um, we have a large Kala Chakra uh, Tanka here. Kala Chakra has 24 arms for 24 minutes and 24 hours. Kala Chakra is really, truly an envisioning um, a, compassioned, uh, a compassionate community uh, and enlightened governance. Wouldn't that be nice? This is a big world vision. Have we given up on it? Not if we're doing Kala Chakra. It's difficult, right? Those, those of us who are like born in 40s or 50s, we thought things were getting better. Isn't that true? A little bit better. Like we got through that Vietnam War, we got through all that, and now, you know, we're kind of like, okay, okay, okay. Almost. So, um, but uh, there are big cycles of time and college chakra means we're, we're really not giving up on it. Compassionate community, enlightened governance. Mm. Then we have a whole Tara um, shrine. Uh, behind you, <laughs> you know? So uh, Tara is really, really, um, Tara is really sk truly skillful action, skillful caring action. Um, Tara is one of the um, green, which is the activity. So here we have a very unique uh, Tara based on a vision I had of Tara, um, uh, Tara Madonna offering a child to the world. Um, when we have kids, we're realizing it's an offering because um, they're, we're just holding them up to the world. And um, after a while, maybe as parents, we realize we can't control them. It might take a few years to realize that. <laughs> your offering is like, hey, have this thing. Um, Vajraginius, we mentioned, is really, truly blissful, passionate, 
a loving um, wisdom in the in love with the world feeling. Yeah, I think we can all tap into that. There are times where we're really truly in love, we're in love with the world, even the totally annoying aspects, you know, just like we have that total yes experience, just yeah, yes, yeah, you're just in love with the world. So um, there, um, there's a way to foster that energy and there's a way to work with it and um, identify with it. That's Fajrakini. Um, somewhere here also have Chenrezi practice. Chenrezi um, practice uh, is kind of like the real, uh, Chenrezi entire real chaplaincy practices because Chenrezi is really like loving eyes, it means actually in Tibetan loving eyes and, and uh, sometimes translated um, Kuan Yin or Kanan uh, in Japanese and Chinese, Chinese and Japanese. So that means uh, hearing, the, hearing the cries of the world. So um, like Chen Rezi, very much uh, connection with chaplaincy and, and mental health work, you know, just like I see you, I hear you. I'm just here, I'm, I can see you, see you, I can hear you. You know, I'm listening. I'm, I'm, I'm aware, you know, like that really, truly doing that. <clears throat> and Paul Dan Lama, it's a protector practice we have. It's a fierce, um, when you feel fiercely protective of yourself, your values, your friends, the planet, your animals, then you're manifesting. Just, just three more. You're with me? Is that too much? Okay. Uh, Medicine Buddha. Um, uh, Medicine Buddha is also, uh, or Healing Buddha, by Sajiguro. Um, so uh, that's kind of the quintessential for people in mental health and medicine world, um, identifying completely with uh, un unobstructed, unreferenced healing. So um, I'll say more about Medicine Buddha later, but I think we're still doing once in a while, we still do medicine Buddha practice, don't we? Susan's and you know, Brad. Um, it's really important, that, and those in dealing directly in clinical work, um, to be able to stay fresh and stay giving um, without uh, compassion fatigue, as Tenzin Shoki was talking about, or burnout or something, and still be excited and interested and. Uh, useful to others. Uh, so personally, I like doing a lot of medicine Buddha practice like that. So yeah, that that helps me, you know, so um, resting in a very sky like blue healing nature like that. So um, then we also have here like we have, I'm not telling everybody but Maitreya um, over here, Maitreya is interesting. Buddha, the future, it's called Future Buddha's um, sitting uh, chair style, which is very legitimate. So maybe all of you sitting in the chairs are manifesting Maitreya, right? So um, Maitreya is really like truly having loving kindness. So that's so important, um, particularly in sanghas, like um, when people just, just you know, that we're, we're not, they're not necessarily so wise or passionate, you know, it's like, they're just really kind, you know, somebody doesn't even know us, you know, just somebody, you know, just, just being kind, you know, can just little random acts of kindness can touch our hearts, can't they? But what if our overall energy was being incredibly kind? You know, no, no fancy stuff. You don't have to be super wise. You don't have to be super skillful. You don't have to be super loving or passionate. Just like, okay, just just be kind of like, just be kind of kind, and, okay? <laughs> so uh, that's, um, that's why there's so much energy. You know, my teacher wanted to um, build a huge statue of, of Maitreya here in, in America like that, and, and Lama Zopa's done, they've done the statue of Maitreya at Land of Medicine Buddha, which is right impressive, you know, just, gosh, you know, just, if you can't, if you can't figure out anything, you can't remember any teachings, you can't, you know, just, you could be a little bit kind, right? <laughs> so, 
all these qualities are, are essential in nature. They can't be destroyed, but they need to be you know, fostered and renewed and, and um, acted upon, right? And we can do it. So at this Sangha, I like to say that we're, we're willing to work with difficult people in difficult situations. Um, traditionally, um, a lot of um, Buddhist groups in Asia and here, they just want to be have a nice um, bandwidth of um, you know, uh, you know, nice people that aren't annoying and you know, just like this. It's always like this. This is a special situation. You're here for a short period of time. You're all nice. It's nice. But this isn't all of Dharma, right? Dharma means we're going out and meeting and integrating and helping and setting up all kinds of different situations for people. So it isn't everyone sitting quietly, being polite. We know it's not. That's not our whole lives, right? <clears throat> so uh, here at Tempo, I emphasize the chaplaincy aspect and going in the medical aspect and the psychotherapy aspect so that uh, we can engage people where they are, not wait until they come here, not wait until they say, I'd want to be Buddhist or I am Buddhist. That, that's, that's just Dharma Club, right? So, uh, you know, a challenge to Buddhist groups here and Broad as to broaden our ability to benefit others, um, both um, medically and behaviorally, psychologically, um, because um, generally, at least in the West and also in Asia, uh, it's the social systems, the medical systems, and the um, mental health systems that really have to be the holding tank, right? We need to strengthen those, right? So coming, hearing nice Dharma talk with beautiful paintings and nice, beautiful people who all smell good, you know, that's, that's rare, right? That's rare. That we're, we're trying to train as professional bodhisattvas so we can um, go out and work with others um, and uh, extend the bodhicitta beyond just the comfort zone. Don't you think? Like that. But I understand we need a refuge too, so we need a nice, Beautiful temple to come to, feel good, you know, just not hassled. So I, I want to support that, but then I want people to gain the bodhisattva skills so that we can deal with people that are struggling socially or economically, mental health, physically, right? That's the real expression. We, we can't turn Lions Roar into Lions Roar Hospital right now. But, um, one teacher that was one of our friends, Arja Rimshe, is, you know, was, is behind a major hospital in, in Mongolia, right? I don't remember what the name of it is, but, you know, sometimes people say, well, where are the Buddhist hospitals? Well, frankly, a lot of them were destroyed. <laughs> That's why there's not a lot of Buddhist hospitals. But we need more things like that, right? The social work and the mental health work. So that also is charged to come back to Vajrayogini when we're passionate and we just can't bear to see others suffering, then that, um, that kind of fierceness comes out, don't you think? And um, I didn't uh, want to spend the whole time uh, talking about Vajrayogini because I want to reserve another talk about Vajrayogini that has to do one of my back in two weeks, right? Has to do with, with gender and all those complicated issues, right? Do you want to hear about that? That's a hot button issue, right? Oh, was, and you know, sex and gender, that's always the thing with all religious traditions, right? Who's, you know, who's, who's doing what to whom? So <laughs> who gets it? Who gets to have the juice, right? So uh, we have to confront that head on. You know, we, we can't just, um, go along, we have to talk about, you know, gender and race um, for Dharma to really be alive. But so um, I'm hoping we can uh, just have a few minutes of discussion before we take a lunch break. But talk too long? Okay, so uh, we, do, um, we do have a microphone. So I'm interested in people's questions and com comments and even complaints. But you have to raise your hand. <clears throat> I 
Thank you, Lama. I just love your talk. It was wonderful. Um, I just wanted to um, talk about how, um, well, I'm one of those people that hates to see people suffering. I've always been that way. Even if I don't know them, if I see somebody crying, I just want to go over there and find out what's going on. Um, but I, I just wanted to say how um, reaching out to somebody and helping them really can make you feel wonderful. So it's a, it's kind of it's both ways. You get as much benefit as they do. Um, I have this friend on Facebook. She's not really a friend friend. I met her once at a fundraiser and we sat at the same table and talked for a while and we just swapped Facebook information and um, I really don't know that much about her. Um, but lately, when I post my paintings on Facebook, she'll make some mm. comment. But a couple times, they were very um, uh, confusing. They were like, she was in pain. I could yeah. tell she was suffering. Um, and I don't know her, but I felt like I needed to, to reach out to her, even though I really don't know her at all. And I was a little bit afraid. I thought, <laughs> I have to admit, I was a little bit afraid because I thought, oh, if I reach out to her, then she might just cling to me and, you know, and want more and more and just dump and dump and dump. I had this fear, but I thought, no, no, I can't because what if she really needs a friend? Mm -hmm. And I can't just let that go. So I um, sent her a private message and she thanked me and said that that already made her feel better. And she asked if I, um, she said, maybe you could help me. Mm. So I just sort of um, explained what I do for myself and how I keep a gratitude journal and I write in every morning and every evening and I meditate in the morning. So I just mentioned these things to her. So you know, she's willing to try, but it just made me feel so good that I, I didn't let my fear of her response stop me from reaching out. Yes. So I, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the talk, Lama. We talk about Vajra Rogini on her own side. We also talk about Vajra Yogini in union or Yabhyum with Vajra Sattva. And how are, how are they related or different? So, so in Tantra, you know, we, we use the human form to try to um, explain these qualities, right? So sometimes people are in embrace and sometimes solo, it looks like, right? Um, but, um, you know, actually, it's always the same thing is going on, no matter what. So it's always this experience of simultaneously embracing the world and being embraced by the world. The solo part is uh, our own experience is totally our own experience, you see. We, we can't transfer our experience to someone else. We, we can't say, well, I want you to have exactly my same experience. So in Dharma, we say we, we have a shared experience. Do you want to share this? You know, do you want to share this chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's why the Buddha said, you know, it's not oneness, it's not two-ness, it's interdependence. This is important, okay? So when we're, whether we're looking at a uh, Buddha figure, male or female solo or in embrace, um, really the same thing is happening. We're, there, we're always in embrace and interdependence with the world. One is, is emphasizing um, the uh, shared experience, uh, one side of reality, you know, because we're all sharing this experience right now. But we're also at simultaneously having our own um, 
uh, private experience, private in the sense of uh, we can't give it to anybody else. It's absolutely sovereign, right? So that's what's particularly important about um, uh, Vajogini, who's uh, uh, not totally like out of sight, fierce with all kinds of weapons, but triumphantly, blissfully um, the sovereign, you see, like that. So, um, uh, like when people are, um, like when we're in a helping profession with others, uh, you know, a very important piece is to honor someone else's suffering. You know, not just to immediately give them advice or dismiss it, right? Or try to fix it. You know, to listen and hear someone's story or just feel their presence or their tears or their rage or something and just to honor that, right? That's given them the sovereignty of their own experience before we say, well, you should have experienced it this way. <laughs> or you, you wouldn't be so freaked out if you just experienced the way I've experienced. No, give, you know, at least give people the sovereignty and honor a dignity of their own experience, even if it's really off at first, right? Of course, you know, people need help, but that's that solo experience. We can't really, no one can actually have our own experience. We can't have theirs, but we can share, we can meet in the middle. That's why I like the middle way metaphor, right? I like that. So whether you see solitary or what's sometimes called consort or father, mother, really the same things going on, but from different, we're appreciating uh, the shared experience or appreci appreciating the sovereignty of our own experience. This is important you guys get this, otherwise the Tantra things don't make much sense, you know? <laughs> Why, why we have all these archetypal deities, you know, we're trying to bring um, the, uh, you know, bring, bring it out of an idealistic universe, actually, uh, into our actual lived experience of being in relationship with each other like that. Hmm. Good question. Hi. There's an online question, and I don't know who that is, but they, we're going to let it roll, right? Okay. Well, I, th I think that was me, Lama. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, well, uh, you know, the translator Carl Grunholtz wrote a book about the Heart Sutra called the Heart Attack Sutra. Right, right, right. And uh, so I was wondering if that's the su the Heart Attack Sutra that if Vajrayana is what follows the Heart Attack Sutra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um... Do you want to say more about that? Because you have an idea there. How, well, how... you were talking, just because you were talking about the uh, Vajrayana being more like the emergency room. Yeah. Yes. So the, the, once, you, once you get the heart attack from reading, from understanding the heart attack sutra, maybe you need to go to the emergency room of Vajrayana. Right. That was... <laughs> so that's right. So with uh, the teachings on emptiness, in the Prajnaparamita Sutras, um, the rugs kind of pulled out from under us. So we have this heart attack and Vajrayana is like, uh, what, what to do when you've had the heart attack? The good news with the heart attack is um, the world has gotten your attention. Generally after, um, I'm kind of normal that way, you know, after a, um, a health correction, I, I, you know, say, okay, now I'm really getting to the gym. <laughs> now, no, I'm not messing around, you know, so the, the, the Prajnaparamita sutras, yes, and I like Carl Bunzel's thing, so a heart attack meaning, you know, it gets our attention too, but we, we're motivated, incredibly motivated to, to do something about it. So, uh, you know, the, the Prajnaparamita turns into, you know, in the sense, um, takes birth as Vajrayogini, um, or historically, you know, um, uh, Yeshe Sogyal history in Tibet, and uh, a long line of female yoginis, right, here, here right now. So, is that helpful? I don't know. Kind of? Makes sense? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Good question. I have a question. Oh, okay. Um, I, 
So Vajrayogini has fangs and yeah. so does Kala Chakra. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the fangs. Is it a sort of an animal nature or sort of a, it feels very physical to me, feels also kind of wild side. Yeah, so, um... You know, generally things with fangs are going to, you know, be out for blood. <laughs> and here it's like to the the red and the blood thing has taking taking the blood out of the misperceived self, the narcissistic grandiosity and you know, um dangerous, right? That that side and uh reinvigorating our you know, real aliveness. So, you know, blood has that whole um, quality like that. So, the uh, Vajogini and is um, uh, sometimes in the you know, traditional thing, like Dakini would just refer to a vampire. Because, of course, like Vajogini um, in the Tanka, you didn't say, but is is also encountered in the charnel ground. So um, there's there's a lot to talk about how uh, it isn't just doing the practice voluntarily, like, okay, Vajagini sounds good. I want to do the impairment in the practice, but in real life, uh, many times Vajagini is an encounter with um, reality, a, a, an uninvited encounter with reality that wakes us up or that stimulates us to, to take um, what I like to call the Shambhala journey or the heroic journey. Um, so uh, the fangs and the fierceness um, mean that change and transformation um, do not always come about willingly or um, you know, soft and cushy, that it's got teeth to it. Um, but, but it's essentially um, trans, transformative. So a big part of Vajrayogini lore and myth is the transformative practice, uh, transformative um, aspect, the alchemical aspect where we're, we're heating things up and we're burning off impurities and we're, we're warming things up like that. Um, and um, we're willing to, um, you know, uh, go, go right to the life force like that so <laughs> got teeth dharma has teeth yeah so we can be fierce fiercely compassionate fiercely protective yeah Sure. But um, I find it fascinating that you talk about Vajra, 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 yeah, Vajra. It's a little hard to say, yeah. Sorry, Sanskrit, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but I find it interesting because a female figure being depicted in what looks like more of a man than a man, uh, very aggressive. Yeah. Probably, you know, like using SAG terms, like Vajogini would be very assertive, right. not, not aggressive in that she's, you know, taking over someone's territory without permission, but um, very confident, extremely confident. Yeah. Right. And I, uh, I find it interesting, too, it, it seems that this is a figure that's very, uh, easily fearless. Yeah. So completely open, vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, right. And Right. Yeah. 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 Right. So, uh, if I were to say, I, I my experience in understanding Buddhism so far, would have told me that that's probably, well, this would be my bias, so I'm being very, very um, transparent. That, that would not be the symbol I would expect. It wouldn't be an aggressive female nude figure drinking blood from a. 
<laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Usually, these practices um, are uh, secret in the sense that they're only given out when someone's uh, reached a certain level of maturity, because it's easy to misunderstand, right? So generally, um, most of the exoteric practices are going are, are going to be peaceful forms, right? You know you know, cool down a little bit, chill, be warm, but don't be hot, right? So um, Vajrayogini practice does entail doing um, a lot of, or continuing to do a lot of the foundation practices so that uh, we're being skillful when we're, when we're using a lot of energy. Otherwise, it's like turning on a fire hose without holding it. So there are always warnings given in Tantra, like don't start if you're not willing to do the preparation or finish like that. So it, it's not about using raw aggression or raw anger. Um, it's it's very it's you know very skillful like that. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Is the mic on? Just. Okay. There okay. you go. Okay, I had a question about this banner and the deity on it. I just was wondering if you could give me like a description um, and possibly like explain some of the symbolism in it. It's like very the, the Kala Chakra, the big one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you're gonna have to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so Kala Chakra means like time cycle. So that's um, can we really truly harmonize with with time? So Kala Chakra and uh, this mother father aspect, you know, and embracing and being embraced. Uh, can we really embrace time? So really in our tradition, we come to the unconditioned through the conditioned world, right? So we say unconditionally, I'm, I'm willing to accept conditions. So we say yes to time. We say yes. Usually in religious traditions and also some psychological traditions, people want to leave their bodies and escape, right? You say, I don't like the world. I don't like time. I don't like my body. I don't like responsibilities. I don't like others, you know, like, so um, particularly color chakra is, is about compassion and community and uh, governance, but it's uh, also the method is saying, uh, uh, saying yes to time and diversity, because there's so much going on, right? So usually we're just kind of going, there's too much effort going on, I just want to get away, like, eff it, I'm done. You know, so um, Kalachakra is saying yes to the complicated world. Usually we don't, we, we, there are times when we need to be solo in our retreat, of course, um, but there's, there's no permanent um, exit from complications. Not on this planet. Do you disagree? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> next planet, maybe. Yeah, so Kalachak is a complex practice to let us be comfortable with the complexity. That's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe one more, and then we can do closing prayers. Maybe we covered it. Go, Brad. So, you know, each tradition has different. Uh, a Vajrayogini um, like lineage, are there big differences in the different lineage of Vajrayogini? And does that matter, I guess? I guess that's yeah. the question. Um, the realistic answer is that um, because there are different teachers and different people, there's going to be differences because it all comes down to like how you do it. Um, I, I think uh, uh, a difference that we're experiencing, uh, hopefully moving forward is, you know, somewhat taking Vajagini out of just an art, just the archetypal realm and, um, you know, bringing into some kind of uh, 
you know, parody or some kind of respect for both male and female energies or or non-binary energies, you know, so that that's going to be another talk, but um, uh, Rajan is very much into different um, methods because we realize that people have very different approaches and need to, you know, find their um, their freedom in, in different ways. So uh, just on an iconographical traditional way, some Vajraginis are dancing, right? Like, and this one's in a, that we've displayed is the Naro Dikini in, in this warrior pose. Um, but, uh, you know, some, the kind of, like my teacher was very much into Vajogini, and I did Vajogini retreats with him. And um, he um, wanted to be, and was dressed up and as Vajogini as he died. So this is more than just kind of the psychological world of I'm, I'm just developing my fierce compassion. You know, it's like, it's interesting when you talk, when we talk about with people with how they want to be remembered or do they want to be buried or cremated, then, then the dying process becomes very literal, right? You know, like that. So, um, you know, some Vajragini, you know, practitioners, you know, they're really uh, taking their practice very literally, bringing their power into the world. So we, we have those uh, examples in history, right? And hopefully in the West, of course, in the Sangha, there's, you know, hopefully there's, there's strong uh, female energy, we want more. But we also have to explore like, well, what really is we go looking for? What's really male or female energy? What's non-binary energy? You know, is this merely imputed or is there something? But um, on a very practical level, we, we have to have, for Dharma to be relevant, this has to be a shared power, right? So um, you can't just idealize it. I mean, it's very easy to idealize archetypal images, but then on the ground, it, it doesn't play out, right? quite more will have to be said like it's a different and the, if we do a Vajragini empowerment here it's it's very very archetypal and ritualistic right so that's not the end of it it's meant to kind of um like weddings right <laughs> the only thing you actually do in this country are weddings and graduations right that we really believe are real things that have happened because they have legal consequences there are a few other things. I mean, of course, people are giving birth and doing other things, but these are ceremonies that, you know, a lot of times people say, I don't believe in ceremonies or rituals. But when you get to talking to them about their weddings or about funerals or about sometimes births too, things get very literal. I don't want that person there. I want that color. You know, I want that venue. We're not saying those vows. We're not doing vows, period. You know, suddenly the love, you know, you just love and say, oh, let's get married. And then, then everything gets really kind of very concrete, doesn't it? It's very specific. So um, that's what we're doing at Vajrayana. We're, we're also trying to say there's this archetypal energy that's very fluid and very um, accessible. But at the same time, when we bring it into our lives, it's going to get very specific. So you know, Guru Shea, who's credited with establishing Buddhism with Trisun Detson and um, Shantarakshita said, my, my view is as vast as the sky, my activity is as fine as barley flour. If you've ever tried bar barley flour, really just, you know, very fine, right? So um, Vajrayana, traditionally, we, we, we want to concretize as much as possible um, what's what's real about the archetypal things but we don't have to dress up we, you don't you don't have to show up as Vajragini next next time right <laughs> you know so the the visualization archetype um uh is a powerful psychological and um mind aspect of the practice but then um 
the, the qualities and the activities are also going to seem very concrete, right? You know, Vajrakini runs corporations and Vajrakini does dishes and Vajrakini does all these things. Well, more should be revealed, right? But think about weddings and funerals and births, right? Or graduations. Who didn't want to go to their high school graduation? Anybody here? You know, there was some concrete reason you didn't want to go. I'm making, not participating in this war or this capitalist bullshit or something, right? It was very concrete where other people go, it's just a graduation, you know, just show up, say the words, get the diploma, move on, you know? But my John is going to have both of those, the fluidity of the dreamy archetypal world uh, and the flexible mind non-clinging world and also like no i do want you to show up on time right yeah and i do want a comfortable cushion and, and we do want to end on time because even after impairments like then everybody runs to the restroom so after <laughs> the last major one with dalai lama in long beach so long right so i've already told the story so I, I couldn't have filmed it, it'd be weird, but like all these Rinpoche's and Lamas run, male, of course, they're running to the restroom. So there are these golden robes all lined up. There's this, that, like the stadium had this little, and I thought, this is weird. <laughs> but it just shows, like my teacher said, even, even the Buddhas have to go to the bathroom, right? Don't you think? Okay. Yeah, I hope so, yeah, you know, it's like. All right, so let's do a closing. Omo Aray Pazayana Aindi Om Aray Pazayana Aindi